Thank you very much. Hope that you can hear me and you can see my screen. So just I put away VM doctor. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So I will talk about esophageal atresia repair with thoracoscopy technique. That is my favorite subject. I like it. I like to talk about it very much. So you asked me just to talk how to make the anastomosis better or equal to open approach. So I will show you that it's almost better than open approach. So I always start my lecture in this difficult time just to support my great friends in Ukraine. So this is that we are staying together. We know that Russia invade Ukraine and Ukraine is very close to my heart. So forgive me just to mention about it. So, you know, the history of, uh, I just only switch on a time check not to be too long, okay. Uh, so it's, you know, the history started in 99 with the first procedure performed by Tom Loeb and Steve Rotenberg. And what's very interesting, it was done on type A esophageal atresia. So it means that it is the most difficult, the so-called uh, long gap esophageal atresia. So where we are after 23 years. So that was just recently last year, there was an interesting study from USA. They checked the five years uh, time uh, between 2014 and 2018. So they checked <clears throat> how often it was thoracoscopic approach for type C esophageal atresia. So they identified 855 patients. So to my surprise, only 16% if such a modern country like USA were approached by thoracoscopic technique. And even worse, there was 53% of conversion. So only 63, so less than 10% were completed by thoracoscopic approach. So and as you can see, the time for thoracoscopic approach was 217 minutes. So the conclusion is not very optimistic. However, one thing is positive that the perioperative outcomes were almost the same as open technique. So just a few words about my department. I am working in Wroclaw. This is Southwest of Poland. This is the fourth biggest city in Poland. We cover the region of about 4 million inhabitants, uh, but we drain <coughs> from the whole uh, Poland also. So we started with the first procedure in 2005, and right now we are one of the main referral centers in Poland for esophageal atresia repair. Uh, there was more than 350 different thoracoscopic procedures for a reason uh, in uh, uh, esophageal atresia. We have also our own uh, operative technique that I will present you later for long gap using internal traction suture. Since this year, we are the member of Ernica. Ernica, this is Europe, European reference network for rare diseases. So my personal experience right now is more than 235 newborns operated by thoracoscopic approach with all types of esophageal atresia operated in different countries all over, uh, around the world. But at my department, we operated since 2005, 179 newborns uh, with all types. <coughs> And what's very important, all these cases were managed by thoracoscopic approach. So this is just a standard technique at my department. This is the procedure of choice. <clears throat> uh, the technique uh, uh, has changed a little bit with our experience. So the first one was the position of the patient. At the beginning, it was lateral. Right now, it's full prone position. And as you can see, the patient is uh, positioned at the edge of the table. That's very important because it gives you a free, a free movement of, of uh, instruments. <clears throat> uh, the landscape, uh, uh, anatomic landscape is the scapula. So we place all the trockers around the scapula. You use five millimeter optic. 
that is more distal and it uh, is situated between working ports. So just maybe you are surprised with this PD up the video, but just want to show you the whole procedure. This is uncut video from the whole procedure the, from skin to skin that lasted 46 minutes. So this is just the uh, ligation of the fistula. You can see with the sliding knot, it closed already. So then we start with the upper out pouch dissection. Look, the camera is not moving. We are not using any coagulation, no irrigation, no suction. Look for the opening of the upper pouch and also the distal fistula. It's not cut completely. And from upper pouch, the tip is still uh, attached to the uh, upper pouch. It's just for handing the tissue, just keeping. If you don't cut the distal pouch from the fistula, it will not disappear. So it keeps it close to your anastomosis site. So this is the first stitch. The next one, and after this, look, this is, of course, it's very speedy, but the video is available on uh, Stay Current. You can see it. And this is just the moment that I cut off the fistula completely, and I cut off the tip of the upper pouch. And then I continue with the uh, anastomosis. Look, the azygos vein is untouched. I never cut it. It's a, a very important organ. Uh, it gives a blood supply to all the surrounding tissue. And uh, what's important, it's not only me that is doing this surgery, it's also my resident. So probably it's even difficult to uh, find the difference between all the stitches. So my residents are very well uh, trained with making uh, suture. It's a completely bloodless operation. You cannot see any blood in the operating field. So this is why we don't use any suction, no irrigation. Usually we start with the six millimeter of mercury, uh, the inflation pressure, then we lower it to four. Uh, at the beginning, we uh, close the fistula with the clips. Right now we just suture it. It doesn't matter whether you start the anastomosis from the anterior or posterior wall, because you can, with the suture, you can rotate the esophagus around as I am doing. So even if you have uh, like this, the, uh, the posterior wall, uh, of course, uh, when looking to this picture, uh, so you can rotate the esophagus around so it's easy to do the anastomosis. So as I mentioned, all the procedure took us 46 minutes from skin to skin. So if we are happy with the procedure, we don't use any drain, chase drain. So some words about long gap. For me, it's only type A and type B. So I'm not talking about difficult type C. So internal traction technique principles, you can see this is the upper pouch, the lower pouch, and the internal traction, this is the suture between the pouches. So this is the first stage. This is the newborn four days old without any gastrostomy. It's type B, so fistula was already closed. Uh, the upper fistula. So you can see that this is the thread coming uh, from the upper pouch to the lower one. And then it uh, the clips are uh, placed across the tip of the lower pouch. This is the sliding notch. So right now you can see that there's a loop of line going from the upper pouch to the lower pouch. And because the line is locked between the clips. So this is why we need two sliding knots on each loop. So you can see that step by step, I am taking both esophageal ends together. And there is also no diatermy, no coagulation, no suction, no irrigation. And you can see that the operative field is completely clean. There is no collateral damage to the pleura, to the lung. So this is just the first step. So this is, you can see, both esophageal ends are together. So just the same case, five days later, also without any coagulation, no diatermy, 
Of course, there is some bleeding right now, but this is not very important bleeding. So you can see that right now it's possible to bring both esophageal ends together. It was an ideal case, but as you can see, the upper pouch is very good, well, it's very well developed. This is the lower pouch, also very thick. So there's a good tissue to make the anastomosis. So this case was so perfect that there was even no stenosis after operation. And because it was from the other side of Poland, so it, I never saw it again. Uh, and if you cannot complete the anastomosis on the second stage, you can do another one. So you can re reopen the sliding knot and bring both esophageal ends using the same suture again. So what is the perfect, what is the chance to make a perfect esophageal anatomy? It is a sliding knot. This is something that changed completely my surgery. When Professor Chauderna from Gdańsk, when we were in Venice in Italy on IPEC Congress, showed me how to do a square, a sliding knot, suddenly everything changed. If you do how if you know how to do a sliding knot, sliding knot is a perfect knot because it's not zero one knot. I, I mean about open close, but you can adjust the tension between tissues so you can use it to approximate the tissue even under great tension. This is how I am doing it. In uh, for instance, this is just a ligation of the uh, distal fistula. So this is just a real video. So you can see that right now it's very easy, but I remember my first endoscopic knot that took me almost one hour. Right now with exercise, with experience, it's really, really very easy. But it is almost like riding a bike, you know? When you watch people riding a bike, this is my granddaughter, it's very easy, just sit down on a bike and go. But when you, if you have no experience, it's not possible to sit on the bike and ride by it. So this is the same with the making endoscopic knot. Probably this is the most difficult part of any endoscopy. So this is why when we organize endoscopic courses, we start with to teach people how to make the, uh, the knots, endoscopic knots. So this is just the course that we have at our department. It's a three-day intensive course of endoscopic suturing. We have a special equipment. So we, uh, the uh, students train are trained how to do it. And after three days of extensive and intensive course, they really know how to do it. They, they at least have the idea how to do how to do uh, the suture. And this is a very good practice for everyone student. It doesn't cost too much. It is a repeated practice. So we just exercise each aspect of endoscopic knot. And there's a lot of details that are very important. For instance, when whether you move both instruments at the same time, when you make a loop around one instrument, don't close it because you will stuck with the instrument inside it. So there are a lot of details that are very important that let you, when you know it, it lets you do a perfect endoscopic knot. So we even constructed a special endoscopic model for esophageal atresia repair. It's from Silastic. So you can see that you can be trained perfectly how to do it. This is a rear operation and just the model to exercise. So each of my residents at my department uh, uh, is very well trained how uh, to uh, how to uh, do it. So some words about the results at my department. So right now we collected 145 type C and type D cases. All cases were managed by thoracoscopic approach. So operative time medium was one hour, 31 minutes and early mortality, especially you can see on this uh, graph that the mortality was mainly at the beginning. Right now we have just single cases. Even the late mortality is not very high. We had at the beginning 10 cases with leakage. Right now, I cannot recall anyone. 
And as you can see, the stenosis that I will talk later was about uh, 24%. We had just only one case of recurrent chief, and probably this is because of a zygous vine that uh, we left uh, uh, intact, because it separate the anastomosis from the, from the uh, fistula closure. Fund application is not very frequent in my in, the, in, in my experience. It's all, it was only for five cases of type C and D, and we are still until now happy to have no conversion, zero percent. You can see the operative time it decreased. So right now it's one one hour and thirty with my residents. It's it's optimal time, and it's very interesting also for uh, when you compare our results with the statistic I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. Of course, we don't have 855 uh, cases, but look, all the cases were managed by thoracoscopic approach and there was no conversion at what's very important because it gives you the impression what the how important is experience. 85 minutes medium time. 270, this is my saying, that if you operate, if you do endoscopic procedure for more than two hours, maybe it's interesting for the surgeon, but not for the patient. So also very interesting, this is the long gap. So this is type A and type B. This is our last nine cases that were primary cases. So they were managed without any gastrostomy in all these cases, we were able to do the esophageal anastomosis may more often after two stages, but there was also a case that required four uh, stages. And the medium hospital stay was 31 days for these patients. And there was no electrosurgery, no irrigation, no suction at the procedure. So if you ask me about thoracoscopy for esophageal atresia repair, it's of course difficult. It's challenging, it's demanding, great experience needed, not for everyone, but it should be the procedure of choice in right hands as it is at our department. And if you think about thoracoscopy for long gap esophageal atresia, it will change completely the way we manage uh, this patient. At my experience with primary cases, for more than 50 cases right now, I had only one that I had to do a esophageal transposition, a replacement, no other cases. All were managed with internal traction. And this is the case that required six thoracoscopic procedures. And finally, it had the baby had its own esophagus. Uh, is it a real game changer? I recently had a lecture at a British Association of Pediatric Surgery meeting. So my answer was yes, it's a real game changer. But what we need to do to change the game? First, we have, you know, there is a beautiful sentence from the book uh, published in USA, The Surgeon and the Child. This is an old book, but with no language, but they cry, children are looking for better surgical treatment. So what we have to do, let's start to think about newborn as a subject, not object. It's, I had a discussion with one uh, consultant from UK and I asked him why you are doing open surgery still for esophageal atresia. And he, his answer was because we have to teach young residents how to do it open. Could you imagine the situation that you are going to the adult patient that has uh, had to do, uh, had to uh, have a, a, a cholecystectomy, and you are talking to him because that you have to learn your resident how to do it open, and you will do open cholecystectomy. Not, it's not possible. So the same. Let's start to think about newborn as the adult patient. So open question: Should we operate two or three cases a year in a single center, or? Is it time for centralized treatment or close cooperation for patient with long gap? We are kings and queens of rare diseases. And look for this uh, picture. 
how the complication changed in Netherlands when they centralized the care for oncological patients. It's a dramatic change. So we should also do it for our pediatrics. Thank you very much. Thank you.